So I think what we do is we find out exactly what the dangerous idea is today and find out what the dangerous proposition we have to play. So let's find out. Fire on. Somewhere in the near future, life is difficult for the horsemen of the apocalypse, finding themselves left behind as the world moves on without them. I am war, and I rule over conflict and strife. I am pestilence, and I rule all things that are infectious and rotten. I am death, and I rule the ultimate end. Isn't that supposed to be four of us? Famine has not returned since winning the Celebrity Big Brother 43! Cast this modern world! We must find a new human evil appropriate for the present day! And so the horsemen together selected a candidate. They decided that joining them would be... An evil hated by those who study to seek knowledge. An evil with the potential to cause disaster. And an evil mistrusted by the masses. Hi, I'm Statistics. Thanks, <laughs> <laughs> thanks, but uh, I think you've got me all wrong. Statistics isn't evil like you think it is. It's just really easily misunderstood. Let me try and convince you. So my name is Dr. Liam Briley, and I'm a lecturer and a statistician with SIGMA, so that's the Maths and Stats Support Centre at Coventry University. And I'm interested in how we can use stats and models to solve problems in biology and health. Now thinking about statistics, a lot of people think stats is just all about maths and equations, and really that, that couldn't be further from the truth. I like to compare statistics to reading a storybook. It's about understanding the stories that set of data can tell you. Now the, the maths and the equations are a bit like the, the paper and the ink. They're important because without them we wouldn't have a book, we wouldn't have the stats. But they're not the focus, and most statisticians that you speak to are not interested in maths and equations. They're interested in reading that book to learn something new about the world around them. <laughs> We're here to talk about whether statistics might be a force for evil. Well in fact, war, death, Pestilence. Statistics has been used in the fight against each of them. And today I'm going to try and continue that fight. I'm going to make the case against each of these horsemen. So let's start with war. Now war would probably say that statistics is all propaganda. But the reality is a lot of statistics are just very easy to draw the wrong conclusions from. And I'm going to illustrate this with a story about a man who recognised this. Not only did he recognise this, but he used it to save lives during war as well. This man's name was Abraham Wald. And Wald was a Hungarian mathematician who lived and worked in Vienna in the 1930s. And Wald was also Jewish. And when the events leading up to the Second World War began, the Nazi party began to control more power in Europe. Wald and his family moved to the US. When the war was underway, Wald's brilliant mathematical capabilities and his problem-solving skills were sought out by the US government to help them with some wartime challenges. It was actually part of uh, the, the SRG, the Statistical Research Group. Now I know that doesn't sound like much, but this was like the stats equivalent of the Avengers. It was like this <laughs> super squad of some of the best statistical minds the world had to offer at the time, all in one place. And one of the questions that the military asked Abraham Wald was, how do we protect the lives of our fighter plane pilots? I'd like you to just raise your hand if you think you're fairly good at making paper planes. So what the military wanted to know is, where should they put the armour on their fighter planes? Now your first thought might be to put the armour everywhere. And that is a pretty good idea, but the only problem is it makes the planes far too heavy to fly. So we've got to be selective about where we put the armour on the plane. So I'm going to grab one here that I have proverbially, uh, proverbially prepared earlier. So this is a completed paper plane, and you'll notice that I've coloured in the different sections differently. So we've got the, the wings at the front there in green, and then underneath we have uh, the engine at the very front, the body or the, the fuselage in that purpley grey, and then at the back we've got the fuel storage in red. Now, if we can only armour one of the parts of this plane, we have to make a decision which. 
And the way that the US military said they were going to make that decision is that they would review the planes that had returned from battle in Europe. We've seen where the bullet holes are. Susan, you are now in the military's boots, as it were. I'm going to ask you which part of the plane would you like to put the armour on? Um, so looking at this, um, it looks to me as if I'm going to have to, you're going to have to preserve your fuel tank. Because you take mm -hmm. a hit in the tank, you've got to go up, basically. Mm -hmm. um, okay. So I think that's probably a good idea. But your wings are looking well dodgy on this yes, one too. The wings. And if you know anything about World War II fighting place, which I do, <laughs> 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 then uh, your, your engine is going to get fuel in there as well. But, uh, this one's been taking a hit on the fuel of Apple. Okay. They're taking more hits on the wings, though. On the wings, okay. Well, that is what the US military said they wanted to do. They wanted to armour the wings. But that's what... Hold on, hold on, because that is what Abraham Wald said exactly to not do. Why? <laughs> well, what Abraham Wald had worked out is that the enemy gunmen probably weren't accurate enough to target very specific parts of the plane. So he figured out the chances of taking a shot anywhere on the plane must be roughly equal. If that was true, why do we never see bullet holes in the engine in blue? And if your initials were, uh, where are they? Where are the initials on there? If, if you didn't give me your initials, <laughs> you were probably thinking, oh, you missed out my plane. But no, the reason why we can't ever see these missing bullet holes is because we can't observe the planes that receive them. They don't come back from Europe. And this is something that we call survivorship bias. Now the US military got it wrong because they assumed that the planes that came back from Europe were a good and accurate reflection of where the damage was taken. They didn't realize that the planes that didn't come back might have looked different. They didn't realize that sometimes what you don't see tells you more than what you do see. So Abraham Wald told them to put the armor on the engines and that became a military strategy for decades to come, placing the armor on the bit where you never see the bullet holes. But although we don't know how many lives this could have saved. Now survivorship bias is not all about life and death. Once you know how to spot it, you can see that it occurs quite a lot in everyday reality. Take uh, high profile competitions or reality television, where there is one very visible, very successful winner, but we forget about the invisible thousands who are just as talented. Or even social media. That can be so highly curated that we only ever see very positive material from our friends and families. And between the two explanations of either our contexts really do have perfect lives, or there is some survivorship bias, we are much more likely to observe the good times which are shared and not observe the bad times which are locked away. It's obvious what's happening if you think about it, but it's very easy to let your perceptions get distorted. It's very easy to make the same mistakes the US military did. So that is the story of Abraham Wald, and it really is like that old saying. What doesn't kill you makes you observe positively biased samples and causes you to question the validity of all your analytical conclusions. <laughs> now we're gonna move on to um, death. And because death is such because death is such a serious and somber topic, <laughs> we're actually gonna park that. We're gonna do something a lot more fun. Because we are gonna visit the set of one of the hottest new shows on Netflix, and that is CSI Scotland. <laughs> yes. Ah, you've seen it. Um, yes, on this episode of CSI Scotland, we've got two murder cases that we're going to investigate, and I'm going to ask for your help to adjudicate them. I'm going to ask you for, to be my jury. Now, of course, we can't have a jury without a presiding judge, so will you please welcome back to the stage, you've heard of Judge Judy, here is Judge Susie. <laughs> Up there, <laughs> <laughs> Great. in the sun, I'm waiting awake. <laughs> well, have a look at case one, and uh, our investigator here has submitted a report based on some DNA recovered at the scene. And what they've done is they've um, they've matched that against a Scottish database, so that contains everyone in Scotland. There's approaching six million people, and our investigator has shown us here what the DNA of three people look like compared to the murderer. So I'm going to ask. 
Anybody from the jury, just shout out the name of who you think the murderer is. John, John Doe. John Doe, okay. Why is it John Doe? Why John Doe? Do you, do you have an opinion on why it could be John Doe? Well, he, he looked much nicer to me. He's wearing a hat, which I think is quite special. Uh, John Doe, is, is it something to do with his DNA markers? Yes. That's what it's, is, he, is he matching it? Yes, yeah, right. so his, his DNA matches, exactly. And the prosecutor on this case says, well, if only one in two people has this DNA marker, and if only one in ten people has that one, if only one in fifty has that one, if only one in a hundred has that one, yeah. then the chance of any random person sharing all of these traits is 1 over 2 times 10 times 50 times 100, which is 0.001%. So the probability that John Doe is guilty is 99.999%. John Doe is sentenced, case closed, nice and easy. Let's turn around to case 2. So case 2 is the one where we've got um, some CCTV images. And uh, in those CCTV images, our, our investigators done some visual matching. We know the murderer had wavy dark hair and a wrinkled mouth and so on. There's about 60 people that match that description in Scotland. Um, probably it's my advanced age, uh, Prosecutor Riley, but it seems to me that most of these chaps are very similar. Mm, yeah, yeah. Very similar. I don't think we can pick out who the murderer is. So unfortunately, we're going to have to throw out this case. Oh, then oh, well. release the uh, whoever it is in the dock, and uh, I'll have dinner with Chief Inspector McIntyre later and explain the whole situation. And, um, You've seen CSI Scotland, haven't I you? I have. Yeah. See it now. And so, and I, I lose the jury from the responsibilities. Well done, jury. Round of applause. Okay, there jury. we go. There we go. <laughs> Don't applaud yourself too quickly because what if I told you there is no difference between these two cases? There is no difference between them. How can that be? Well, in case two, 60 people match the description. And in case one, our prosecutor said the, the chance of a random person sharing all those traits is 0.001%. Now that prosecutor was not wrong. But what the prosecutor missed is that our DNA matches came from a database of everyone in Scotland. Six million. And 0.001% is one in a hundred thousand. So we would expect 60 DNA matches just by chance. Now of course, if we had some other evidence against John Doe, that's going to stack up against him. But if we were convicting him on his DNA alone, we've just made a really common statistical mistake, known quite appropriately as the prosecutor's fallacy. Now to decision makers like our judge, these misused probabilities can sound really convincing until they're actually translated into, into real people. Now, even though that was a kind of fun game, sadly this does happen in real life. The most well-known case is that of a woman named Sally Clark. And Sally Clark, very tragically, had two young children die of unexplained causes before they reached eight weeks old. Now, sudden infant death syndrome is very, very rare. So rare that the prosecution on her case argued that the chances of seeing a double unexplained infant death were so vanishingly small the only explanation was that Sally Clark must have murdered her children. Now the prosecutor's argument was later taken apart for a number of reasons, but the fact remains, yes, that chance is vanishingly small, but if you consider the large number of families that actually live in the UK, we would sadly expect one double unexplained infant death once every four years. Now because of this statistical mistake, Sally Clark was wrongly convicted she was found guilty, she served over three years in prison before she was released. So the key here is that even very, very rare events can happen if you look hard enough. There are 67 million people that live here in the UK, so one in a million chances are going to come true for, on average, 67 of us, for better or for worse. Very rare things can happen. Mm. Okay. So, when will I win the lottery? When you purchase approximately 67 million tickets. <laughs> we can crowdfund this, guys. <laughs> now, if we're thinking about um, the horsemen of the apocalypse, we won't name them, but I'm pretty sure we can have a good guess of which newspapers they like to read. <laughs> now, I've actually got some of uh, Pestilence's favourites with me, because we do hear some very attention-grabbing headlines about our health and the media sometimes. So uh, in 2015, we heard the following about bacon and cancer. 
Just two rashes of bacon a day raises your risk of cancer. Processed meats pose same cancer risk as smoking and asbestos. Uh, drop the bacon roll, processed meats, as bad for you as smoking again, but this time they put smoking in capitals, so it's a bit more serious. <laughs> what this study actually said was that people who eat an additional 50 grams of processed meat, which is about as much bacon as you'd find on a, a typical bacon roll, they had an 18% increased risk of bowel cancer. It's that 18% that was picked up on in the media. Now, 18% sounds really scary, right? Does this mean that a fifth of us are now going to develop bowel cancer thanks to having a bacon roll in the morning? Well, what the media didn't do is really talk about what that 18% meant. And if we ever hear that our risk has increased, the first question we should ask ourselves is, what was our risk to begin with? So, what I'm going to ask everybody to do is, only if you're comfortable and able to, but I'd like everybody to stand just for a moment, please. Okay, great. And now I'm going to ask everybody to sit back down, except please remain standing if your birthday is on the first or the second of the month. The lifetime risk of developing bowel cancer is 6 in 100. Now that's a risk we can't avoid, it's independent of any dietary or alcohol related factors. We take that risk just by living our lives. Now in a room of about 65, this is what that probability would look like. We'd expect to see 4 cases on average. So if our risk has increased by 18%, it sounds scary because most people will interpret risk increases as absolute risk rather than relative risk when we're not told any additional information. So what do I mean by absolute and relative risk? Well, a lot of people heard that as if we were taking those 6 in 100 people who would develop bowel cancer, adding on 18 to make 24 in 100 people. And in a room this size, we'd be looking at about 16 people standing up. But that isn't what the study said at all. The study reported an 18% increase relative to that 6 in 100. So we only need to add on 18% of 6, which works out at... Can I just ask the person who was stood up before to stand up again, please? Just one single extra case. And remember, to see that extra case, we all have to be eating that extra 50 grams of processed meat every single day. So uh, just in case you haven't had yours yet for today, <laughs> let me give you your daily bacon roll. <laughs> Thank you very much. Can I get you all to sit down again, please? And these kind of uh, absolute and relative risks get confused all the time. We've heard that having multiple CT scans in childhood triples your risk of brain cancer. But that's just going from one in 20,000 children having those scans to three in 20,000. Or we've heard that terrorism-related arrests of ethnically white people has risen 92% in the UK. But that actually only works out at 60 extra arrests in a year. Now these percentages, of course, aren't lies, but it takes a bit of digging to work out what's actually change in reality. And this is why the, uh, the Royal Statistical Society started its scheme of media ambassadors, of which I'm one, and we try and work with the media to help them report on these statistical stories to make sure it's accurate, to make sure it represents the risks in a, in a fair way. And it's really nice to see a lot of uh, media outlets come to us. They want to actively improve their statistical literacy. Having said that, some newspapers still call bacon killer rashes. So we've got a lot more work that we can do. I think one of the things that we, public, Georgian public, find quite difficult is it says 18%, but we never know the size of the, the sample, the survey, and it's headlines in the front page of one of those newspapers, and then any retraction three weeks later is on page 42 at the very bottom underneath the crosswords. Yes. So how can we find out how big those samples were because those, those papers won't tell us. What I would say is if you, if you have a look at some statistics in a newspaper that you're a bit sort of sceptical of, I would 
try and find it online, try and find the original study. Now, I'm not saying to read the original study, because a lot of scientific journals can be quite difficult to access. But if you find the original study, you know what it's titled, and you know who the authors are, you can search for how else has been, had that been reported anywhere else. So have other newspapers reported it differently? Have any official authorities reported it? So with the, the bacon and cancer story, the WHO clarified um, a few statements on what it meant. I think the Institute for Cancer Research did as well. They produced a sort of bite-sized guide as to how to interpret those results. The other outlet you can use is actually the authors themselves. So a lot of scientific authors now will talk about their work on their own websites, they'll have blogs where they'll actually talk about what their results mean, and Twitter is also a fantastic way of doing that. So a lot of uh, scientists will tweet about their work, and the nice thing about Twitter is there's no barrier there for the public to contact scientists. A lot of statisticians and scientists will be very, very happy to answer any questions that they're asked through Twitter, it's really nice because these two sort of communities of science, public, that were traditionally so far apart, are now just sort of a, a single message away. I think it seems more like a double translation. When you look at data, um, you try to summarize it and try to get kind of key figures out of it. But then, um, as we saw just now, you have to retranslate it again and put mm -hmm. the probabilities into actual absolute numbers, right? And this is what a lot of people maybe don't do at the end. They look at the numbers, oh, 30% 30, 30 of people, and it's like, yeah, the sample size was tens of three people. It's like, not that much, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, it, that's, that's such a big part of statistical communication, is really sort of bringing that back to, well, what's actually happening in reality? What does this, what does this mean? What, what would it look like in terms of real people? And we're at the point now where we've trained so many data scientists to do the analysis, well, that's the bit that tends to be left out of the training and teaching. It's how you actually communicate these results to the public. And in a way, what we've all become this afternoon in this room is, is Liam's rational army. <laughs> <laughs> so every time somebody says something stupid, challenge it! That's what I say. It's great, especially with a few drinks inside you. Start fighting a pub. Wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> uh, can we have a huge round of applause, please, for the fourth awesome.